Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. This is going to be a reading wrap up of at least two books. I say that because I wanted to get fairly instant responses down for both. Uh, and there may be some more books that I read before this video goes live. So the first one is The Antiquarian by Gustavo Favaron Patria. And the other is I Remain in Darkness by Annie Erno. So I'm going to start with The, uh, the Antiquarian. This was a book that I picked up uh, having read the page 112 uh, that Brian uh, over at Bookish sent me and really liked it. And uh, I bought this immediately and read it fairly immediately. And I'm going to say I really like it. I gave it 4.5 stars. Um, and I'll, I'll say why I knocked half a star off uh, at the end. Um, so it's the story of uh, a bit of a, an oddball called Daniel who, uh, as he's growing up, he has a sister, has a sort of terrible debil debilitating disease whereby her sort of skin doesn't sort of sit naturally over her bones. It sort of can ruck up and become saggy and expose her bones to sort of breaking quite frequently. So she's pretty much housebound. And she and her brother Daniel, they invent these games where they make these sort of very, very intricate models of buildings and they then spin stories around them. Uh, which sort of have a sort of like soap opera quality, but then they always end in sort of murder and fire, and they burn the, the little paper model buildings. And then as Daniel sort of grows into adulthood, uh, he becomes involved in, in sort of antiquarian books with three other guys, and they call themselves The Circle. They sort of track them down and trade and repair them and, and everything. And he knows everything there is to know about books. Um, but then he's... Uh, He's accused and admits that he killed his wife, stabbed her to death 38 times uh, and is put in an insane asylum because uh, they, they doubt his sort of uh, mental well-being. Uh, and this insane asylum itself is a bit of a sort of an Aisha construct where the two halves are sort of cut off from each other because formerly it was it was used to separate. Uh, it was a hospital that was used to separate uh, wounded soldiers, the two sides of a war who would, you know, prey upon each other within the hospital. So the way the building was constructed was to keep them separate. And what the book is essentially is a detective story. That Daniel's best friend, who is a psycholinguist, uh, is sort of drawn back in by Daniel to sort of extract a confession out of him. But, but it's a confession done through sort of clues and literary, you know, sort of texts and stuff, playing on the notion of, uh, you know, him being a psycholinguist. So that is the plot what I think the book is about, it's about books as artefacts, books as objects. It's about stories and storytelling. And who can we believe stories? Can we believe the people telling them? Uh, and who is almost really who is qualified to tell them? And there's so many interesting ideas constructed as metaphors in here. So, for example, uh, Daniel and his sister Sophia's house burns down because they've set fire to... They built a model of it and they set fire to it as part of their regular sort of uh, games. And that fire catches and actually burns the house down. So it's like it's like sort of a Russian doll thing. And again, that's another one of the images in here that people, the significant players in here, have shadow sides where one person is really two people, but you don't see the second one. And that's one of the things that the psycholinguist has to has to sort of uh, unravel. And I think there's lots of sort of Jung and Reich in here, that notion of the shadow side. Um, there's a terrible story about a, a, a Nazi camp guard who, who took live prisoners' skin in order to not make lampshades, which we know really happened, but to make um, paper for the you know these texts that he would have other literary prisoners uh, sort of transcribe in this sort of beautiful Gothic script uh, of, of I can't remember the text, but people like Seneca and people like that, I think, for his own private collection. So there's a lot about, as I say, books and storytelling. So when Daniel's in the insane asylum, he 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 manages to have some books sent to him, uh, and he sort of reads from this and gathers a crowd of all the people in the asylum with their mental afflictions. He draws a crowd and sort of entrances them, and then later uses them as sort of quoting machines for texts that he sort of implanted in them, got them to memorise through echolalia, where, you know, they sort of echo what he says as a clue to, to the psycholinguist to, to later unravel. So 
it's all about storytelling. You've got the brother and sister storytelling with the models that they set fire to. You've got Daniel in the insane asylum telling story, you know, reading his books and gathering an audience and all the time. And I, I just thought that was fabulous. I, you know, I just, I, you know, on the one hand, you've got this sort of plot and sort of gradual revelation, which is OK. But what really made it is all this, you know, magical stuff about what stories do, how they work. Uh, you know, can you trust them? For example, Daniel says, um, you know, for all his reading, for all, you know, all his bookish knowledge, he still can't find a book that would, ex you know, manage to explain the sublimity of the smile of his fiance. So, you know, you know, what what is the purpose of story? So, you know, I love this. But the reason I knocked half a star off is because as good as his sort of bigger picture images and metaphors are, when he describes things, you know, he's describing things that, you know, visually, but then puts a metaphor on, they're crazy. They don't work at all. So, for example, the wheezing grumble of her voice, thin as zinc whiskers, fell over everything. A single vowel sliced by occlusive fits and prolonged lapses of stammering noise. A tragic hiccup that seemed to pronounce a word like a cough. Constructed with the remnants of long abandoned equipment. So, OK, it's a bit sort of over elaborate, but it sort of works, I think, until the end. So the wheezing grumble of her voice, thin as ink whiskers, not quite sure what that means, but OK, fell over everything. A single vowel sliced by occlusive fits and prolonged lapses of stammering noise. So that's... That's a good way of describing the sensation of hearing her voice. A tragic hiccup that seemed to pronounce a word like a cough. Well, that's a good simile. But then there's this end bit. Constructed with the remnants of long abandoned equipment. What does that mean? Road, road repair equipment? I mean, that, that made no sense to me at all. Um, and another example. OK, so here's another one. When night falls, the air in the streets downtown acquires the oily consistency of a tank of dead fish. Breathing it is like ingesting a handful of wet clay through the mouth and nose, and to look at the couples who cluster in the doorways of bars and the secret meeting places of hookers and pimps and drug dealers in the glare of traffic lights is like seeing visitors at a zoo from inside a cage. Their forms weaken and the contours of their bodies merge into a single mass of volatile, dubious matter. Um, I don't really understand that. Um, you know, this notion of... Like seeing visitors at a zoo from inside a cage, well, does that mean, from the animal's point of view, or as if a human is inside a cage looking out at the visitors of a zoo looking in at them? Maybe something like the sort of the, uh, the Amsterdam red light windows with women in them. I don't know. Um, it, it, it didn't make much sense to me. Um, but the, 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 the last one is kind of an even more egregious example of this problem I had. His words had the consistency of a nail pounded through the tip of a finger. Solitary stabbing imperceptible, the telephone line transmitted them as if they were held up by columns of ice, like the dead body of a fish floating on the surface of an angry sea. That makes no sense to me at all. So his words had the consistency of a nail pounded through the tip of a finger. Um... I assume that means your fingernail pounding something rather than driving a nail through the tip of your finger. Solitary stabbing, imperceptible. The telephone line transmitted them as if they were held up by columns of ice. OK. Like the dead body of a fish floating on the surface of an angry sea. Well, how is the dead body of a fish floating on the surface of an angry sea like columns of ice? And also, if it's an angry sea... The fish, the fish is going to be buried from sight repeatedly by the angry churn of the waves. So it was bizarre. His sort of, his more abstract images to convey the ideas, I thought were brilliant. But when he's describing things visually, specific things like street, like that street scene, I, I thought his 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 metaphors were really poor. Anyway, so four out of five stars. Sorry, four and a half out of five stars. And on to I Remain in Darkness by Annie Arno. Erno. Second book of hers I've read uh, after the years. Uh, this is definitely non-fiction, though, in a way that the years was quite sort of autofic. I mean, there is an element of autofic of this. It's in the form of sort of fragments from a diary as each day she, well, not each day, but she monitors her mother's decline into Alzheimer's. And I read this yesterday for World Alzheimer's Day. Um, first of all, it's five stars. It's superb. It tugs at your heartstrings. 
but there's a lot of ideas in this which you know it is non-fiction but I kind of feel it's it verges on on autofic because she does consider you know she's she's grappling with herself throughout as to whether you know she'll turn these notes into a book to write about you know the decline of her mother whether she should do that or not so you know her mother is is basically you know institutionalized uh, she is suffering from alzheimer's and what Annie Erno is describing is that her mother's body is like a map of the de inevitable decline of her own body in the future. You know, because she, she can plot her own, you know, decay and de degradation of, of her physical being as she w witnesses it happening on her mother. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, you know, her mother is unfortunately, as she loses her mental faculties, it, it reverses the relationship so that, you know, the mother is the child and Annie Erno is the parent, you know, so has to change her, has to feed her. Um, she has to be strapped in to her chair, um, you know, just like strapping a, a baby into a pram, all this sort of stuff. Um, it's, you know, that's that's the heart rending stuff, the details of some of the things she has to do. Um, there is a peculiar, you know, it's from day to day, her mother's condition changes or her lucidity changes that some days she can't feed herself, you know, her hand can't find her, her mouth if she's lost that coordination. And then the next day she's perfectly capable of. So that was never really explained. You know, I wondered if that was a drug regime that she was on and, and really the, the trouble she had uh, coordinating to find her mouth may have actually been a reaction to the drugs or a side effect of the drugs rather than the Alzheimer's because the next day she's perfectly capable of doing it the Alzheimer's hasn't stripped that from her permanently I wasn't sure and I thought that you know that could have been an interesting line of inquiry I don't even know if you're given drugs in in sort of you know late stage Alzheimer's I've, I've no idea um, but the other interesting thing I found in here was you know a lot of the not a lot of time you know when the mother of addressed long dead people you know as if they were in the room Annie Erno translates that as she's not really talking to these dead people she knows they're dead what she's actually doing is 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 using it as a stick to beat Annie Erno with for her negligence for her lack of care and all this sort of stuff and there's a there's a lot of things here you know it's about Erno's guilt which you know given what she does for her mother in here I think is, you know, I understand that someone could feel that, but it doesn't seem justified for her to feel it. You know, is she crying for her mother or is she crying for her own self? Because at some point she knows her body will go the same way as her mother's and maybe her mind will as, as well. Um, but it's a really, it's a, it's a, you know, it's only 78 pages. It's really short. I read it in a day. Um, it's, it's a fantastic read. You know, there's a lot of stuff about with with the reversal of roles of mother and child. You know, when you first have a child, a baby, uh, and it starts to develop, you start remembering things about your own childhood and what you were like at that age and, and things. And here, unfortunately, at the end of her mother's life, it does the same. It throws her no back, even though here she's the parent, but it throws her back to her own childhood. Um, you know, feelings she had towards her mother of hate and, you know, her mother was being unreasonable and unfair. Now, Erno feels those towards the child that is her mother. So the relationship in here is brilliantly portrayed. Four and a half stars. And finally, on to Lurid and Cute by Adam Thurwell. Now, I'd wanted to read a Thurwell uh, book for a while, uh, but the one I wanted was a novella called Kapow, which is out of print. So uh, I tried to track it down through second-hand places. No joy. So uh, I settled on this as my introduction to Adam Thurwell. And... Um, I didn't like it, I'm afraid. Um, he's won lots of awards and prizes. He seems very heavily involved in sort of, you know, presenting anthologies of translated works. Um, yeah, well, um, so uh, a man wakes up in a hotel bedroom next to uh, his sort of closest uh, female friend. I would say the man is married and she has blood coming out of her nose after a night of sex and ketamine that they have had. Um, and then the whole book is this character, is the male character, um, trying to juggle uh, not only the morality but also the timing involved between you know having a mistress and his wife, you know being faithful, uh, not being faithful, uh, being you know staying with his wife. He wants both of them basically. 
Um, and they go to parties all the time, they're drug fueled, and these characters keep rubbing up against each other, and he's very worried that it will show on his face that he's been unfaithful, etc, etc. Um, and that's basically, that's basically it. It's too much drugs, um, for my liking. You know, um, if, if we're to treat these sort of moral, um, discursions uh, seriously um, maybe they shouldn't be under the influence of, of his drug intake uh, that's basically the book but what really sort of is aggravating is the style on the one hand it's quite an interesting voice but on the other hand it's 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 relentlessly annoying and the, it's an annoying because time is sort of you know stretched and mutated here so for example you know he's in a car chase he's driving in a car chase being chased by somebody uh, and yet in the middle of this, he's, he sort of has a nostalgia trip as he passes a place he recognises. In fact, the hotel that he woke up and found his, his mistress with a, you know, blood pouring from her. Um, you know, so time can stretch, you know, particularly when, you know, the, the, the brain needs to focus and it clears everything out. And, and it seems to be a slowdown of time, such as skydivers or mountaineers you know and their face is something particularly perilous so you know it is known but then you wouldn't spend that time sort of you know going off at a tangent you know being nostalgic and you know there's another one where his house is broken into by uh by um well they're sort of kidnappers stroke robbers so on the one hand there's you know sort of him having you know put his hands up and reacting to to these people breaking into his house with baseball bats but again, you know, then he goes off in some sort of discursion about, you know, some association he makes. There's too much of this, of this stuff. And what really annoyed me is that these long pontifications about, you know, the morality of the situation and stuff, everything is chock full of similes and, and metaphors. And most of them don't work. And I can only assume this is deliberate. This is to somehow subvert the notion of what a metaphor is. Because a metaphor takes two things seemingly unrelated, but evidences what the one thing they do share in, in common, a quality, and, and that, you know, the one will illuminate and elucidate the other. But here, they're either non sequiturs, or they're just sort of, you know, too long and dragged out and flogged into to the point of breaking. So, for example... Um, so he's in a he's in a massage no he's in a um, a sauna or a Turkish bath or something. I was interrupted by a hero smiling at a beautiful girl who was almost naked but not quite, who therefore sat down beside me and smiled. And as she did so, my mind just went blank, like the way the wheels on a suitcase go suddenly softly silent when they move from the sidewalk's tarmac onto lavish hotel carpet. So his mind goes blank like uh, the wheels on a suitcase go suddenly silent well one is a sort of a mental process and the other is a sound um, so that to me was a non sequitur metaphor here's another one and okay yes my friend alvaro i know he is used to waking up to discover that his children's kindergarten has been decorated with bullet holes caused by a passing machine gun and is now accustomed to the bribes and threats and protection and whatever other ways the criminal activity reaches the average taxpayer like the way the Broadway shows eventually show up at the quiet provincial theatres, like the ones to which my mother took me to watch the pantomimes, but me, no. Whereas now I was realising that maybe the criminal and dark could also involve me. It was a new metaphysical step. So he's comparing, uh, basically, you know, sort of an extortion racket, or, you know, to, to pay secure, you know, for security by sort of gangsters or whatever. Um... And the way that sort of criminal activity touches the average Joe, who otherwise isn't involved in the in the world of criminality. And he's comparing that to like the way the Broadway shows eventually show up at the quiet provincial theatres, like the ones to which my mother took me to watch the pantomimes. So this is all over the place. You know, first of all, I'm not sure that sort of criminal extortion rackets can be, you know, compared to you know, Broadway shows being taken around the provincial theatres. But OK, if that is a simile, you can buy. But then he sort of elided sort of Broadway shows going off 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 Broadway to him watching pantomimes, which is a particularly UK phenomenon. It's, it's just a mixed melange. There is no formal setting for this book, but it seems to be a sort of cross of UK and US. And that is equally unsatisfactory, that it's just, you know, employs 
references from both. Um, here's another thing. I was surprised by this, but then experiences are deceptive. You can feel the exhaustion of a concubine in the Sultan's harem just by mini-vacuuming the car. What? You can feel the exhaustion of a concubine in the Sultan's harem just by mini-vacuuming the car. <laughs> it's no, that's what I mean, it's a non-sequitur. Technically it's not a simile because it's not a, a, a like or as, but it functions as a simile. Um, she said it very gently, like you might hold a girl's hair away from her face while she's drunk too much on a night out and is vomiting onto the street. Well, if you're cooing, you know, it'll be all right, you know, don't worry, I've got you. If you're cooing that while you're sweeping back the hair of a girl who's vomiting, that's fine, because it's sound compared with sound. But it isn't. It's written as, she said it very gently, like you might hold a girl's hair, hair. So the actual gentleness is holding the girl's hair away from her face while she's throwing up so she doesn't vomit onto her old hair. So again, you're comparing a sound with an action. I don't think that works. And uh, another one. I think only the hard heart, oh, sorry, I think only the hardest hearted reader will begrudge me at least a small amount of exhilaration. I would not be downcast, even if among the bird reserves and estuaries the general monsoon murder rate was very high. I don't even understand what that means. It is a simile. I would not be downcast, even if among the bird reserves and estuaries the general monsoon murder rate was very high. I, I, is that a, a murder rate of, of bird on bird in, in a monsoon hit, you know, enclosure? Because, they you know, they can sense the danger of, of drowning as the waves are, I, you know nonsense and as I say you know this book is 350 pages long if you took out the similes it'd probably be about 50 pages it's, it's just laid it on thickly with a you know with a ladle I think I think it's deliberate you know but I can't see what the point he's trying to make and then finally um so he's going through his, you know, he's, he's being very sort of, oh, woe is me, and is my life terrible, and thinking back to all the sort of childhood diseases and afflictions he had. And he's sort of listing them one by one. And they're all minor afflictions, you know. He hasn't had a sort of serious illness. Um, in the children's hospital, they swaddled me in bandages to try and stop me scratching. And later I learned to bathe my hands in chemicals so that they might harden or else we would also try the various mixtures of twig and bark provided by the Chinatown apothecaries, even though neither my mother nor I believed that they would work, and they tasted very disgusting, and did not work. Yes, you really could continue very minutely when you started thinking in this way. It was like two facing mirrors, or like the way once a moazine begins, it starts off all the other moazines pre-corded moazining. So again, it's it's... You know, Chinese herbs, uh, sorry, it's not the Chinese, it's, you know, it's this sort of litany of childhood afflictions. Uh, when you go through them, it was like two facing mirrors. OK, you know, you're looking back on your childhood. I can see that that one works. But then he's, he's you know, he's sort of glommed on top of it. Or like the way once a muezzin begins, it starts off all the other muezzins, pre-recorded muezzining. I can see what he's trying to say, sort of, you know, once you sort of start, thinking about it and listing them and you know the list gets longer and longer and longer in, in a way that one moazine chant call to prayer you know brings all the others throughout a sort of a town yeah but it just doesn't compute to what he's trying you know to what he's saying about a litany of children so you know this book really annoyed me three stars and finally for friday reads what i'm currently reading the long awaited for me michel hoelbeck serotonin his latest book i'm about halfway through it I won't say anything till I've finished it. Okay, so till next time, thanks very much.